If you're an asset manager in the alternative space and in securities lending, prime brokerage, or repo, then this interview with Marikai Global Advisors is for you. Hello and welcome to Season 3, Episode 2 of PeerPoint Perspectives, The Art of Securities Finance. I'm your host, Roy Zimmerhansel, and practice lead at PeerPoint. This series is focused on technology and our business, and in this case, less disruption and more fluid integration with clients. So it's an interesting approach, and I invite you to stay to the end where I put down, I don't know, a challenge or an invitation to the securities finance community. So uh, stick with it and uh, hopefully listen to my summary of the show. And without any further ado, I'll start the podcast now with Ben Arnold, founding partner and CEO at Marikai Global Advisors, and Michael Ashby, managing director. Hello, guys. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us. I'm really excited about this because, frankly, I've never actually interviewed anyone uh, that covers the part of the the industry that you guys do. So uh, I'm really excited about learning more about it. So so Ben and Michael, thanks very much for joining me. Uh, Maybe we can just start by uh, saying hello and introducing yourself and a little bit about your own backgrounds. Uh, Yeah. Thanks for uh, having us, Roy. Uh, My name's Ben Arnold. I'm the uh, founding partner and CEO of Marikai Global Advisors. And uh, prior to Marikai, I spent the last 10 plus years, maybe 15, can't recall, uh, (laughs) uh, working at hedge funds and at uh, other broker dealers, including Goldman Sachs, primarily in Asia. Um, And I was mostly focused on block transactions, as well as equity and equity derivative sales trading. Thanks, Ed. Michael? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Ashby, and I am the um, Head of Strategy and Business Development for Marikai. I'm based in New York City. Um, prior to uh, this seat, I was operating partner at a fund in London, uh, where I focused on uh, helping run a global long short fund, and then before that, was based in Switzerland for a large um, family office. I'm excited to be on the podcast. Great. Well, look, uh, I think this is truly a global coverage now, because I think between us, uh, we've served everywhere in the world. Uh, Maybe tell us a little bit about Marikai. So so what's the background to it? And and what led you, I guess, then to um, starting it off? Um, Yeah, great question. So quickly, I guess, an intro about us is, um, so we were, Marikai Global Advisors was founded in 2019. um, and, And you know, people always question this, but I founded it with the rebellious determination to deliver conflict-free services to the asset management industry. Um, I had seen in the in the outsourcing industry, in particular in trading, that there were various various things under the hood uh, that fell under the umbrella term of outsourced trading, and that kind of propelled me to to, to start something and, and do it differently. <clears throat> and what we do is we're a leading outsourced trading firm that delivers global multi-asset trading, leverage management, and capital introduction services to a uh, sophisticated and diversified client base. Uh, mostly that's hedge funds, family offices, traditional asset managers, uh, could be corporates, and even uh, private equity firms from time to time. Um, our headquarters is here in Park City, Utah, uh, and we have office in New York and Hong Kong. Um, so we're global in nature. Great. And so was this, was the background to it that uh, you just thought that there was a gap in the market or did customers sort of express concerns to you or saying, gee, I wish there was something like this or, or how did it come? So about? I was actually working in uh, Goldman Sachs in Hong Kong and noticed, you know, sales traders were being asked to do more um, and cover more clients and there were less of us. So the service level was becoming difficult across the street, not necessarily at Goldman, it was just the nature of, of, of the industry. And also buy sides was also cutting, you know, wallets that they were paying to the street as well. So it's kind of like a, a circle that ends up happening together. I eventually left because I saw a, a niche need for outsourced trading and I worked at a, a different outsourced trading firm. And there I kind of honed in a different group of clients that were larger in nature. So call it 
on average around billion dollar hedge funds that traded globally, um, but also were in need of a more sophisticated trading desk and not just outsourcing in terms of a pure execution, but completely outsourcing all of their trading functions, um, but in a way that still suits them given their size of their fund. Um, and we can get into that later, but you know, all funds have different needs, whether it's resources from the street and a lot of how your trading is done in your, in your wallet and how you deploy that changes a little bit of your dynamic around your trading, uh, your trading desk and, and trading needs and traders and systems. Yeah. And I, you know, I was talking to, uh, or I gave a speech earlier this, uh, today, in fact, um, talking about sort of the various changes in terms of forms, in terms of downsizing at the same time that uh, you know, the regulatory requirements are increasing, technology costs are going up, uh, and customer expectations, your own customer expectations uh, are going up. And so it's really these convergence of events when there's just less sort of extra capacity in firms to, to look at that. And and is it is it a question of sort of improving capability or is it a question of focusing on uh, sort of your own sort of centers of excellence? Like what, what kind of drives people to consider outsourcing? Yeah. So I think it's, um, it's always different. Um, it's always different for every manager and every fund that we speak with and every client we have, um, you know, it could be a cost cutting exercise. Um, it could be a entry into a new a new product or a new asset class or a different region or regional coverage. Most funds have gone more global in nature as well as not primarily trading equities. They are trading multi-asset classes. And every time you add a new component to the strategy that you're running, the complexities increase. Uh, market structures are very different. So it is very difficult to find one person that can cover every single product that you want to trade as well as be an expert in every single region. Um, you know, there's not a lot of multi-asset traders that also have global experience uh, in the world, surprisingly, but, you know, being able to provide that and being, you're going to end up needing at least one person, like without a doubt, but most likely three, because it's impossible for one trader to cover 24 hours and very unlikely they can be an expert in every product in every asset class. So that's one of the things we've seen. We've also seen, you know, a lot of people don't like to have another person that they need to manage. So maybe they just, they don't want to have as many people that they need to manage or they want to leverage some of our sophisticated technology. Um, all in all, everyone has really a different need. Um, but I think those are generally what cover it. Um, and they find that, you know, a lot of times their biggest headache has been the trading desk function. So finding a solution that streamlines and makes it simpler for them mm -hmm. without interfering with their, the rest of their front to back operations is really what I think they're always searching for, regardless of how they find it. Right. And mm -hmm. so it's really kind of, uh, people trying to focus on, on what they know best and, and the things that they don't want to deal with. They're looking to exactly. Outsource. I mean, I feel the same way. It's like, <clears throat> Focus on what you do best because that's going to move the needle the most. Hire someone or outsource something to someone who knows it, to knows those things that you don't have time to focus on, but hire the best people for it. Um, and, and I think that that is true in all you know all as, aspects of business. You know, it could be outsourcing operations, it could be treasury. Everyone's been out. You know, people have been outsourcing research services forever um, to independent. Uh, research providers in, you know, more niche frontier emerging markets as well. So it's really no different um, than a theme that we've seen over the past 10 years happening. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. You know, uh, to me, I don't really think about, you know, research as being outsourced, but effectively that that's exactly what it is if you're not doing it yourselves. And, but tell me about uh, outsourcing specifically in the trading space, because, you know, it's been a trend for a few years, but it's, you know, it doesn't have, as far as I'm aware, sort of a, a 10 or 20 year history, or, or am I wrong? So it has been around for a while, but it's had, I guess, uh, a very niche and sort of uh, narrow focus. And that's primarily been U.S. equities <clears throat> with maybe futures. Um, and so I had to, when my last um, role, I was looking for an outsourced trading firm. I really struggled to find somebody that could 
do even 70% of what we wanted somebody to be able to do. I think what's happened in the last five years is that people have realized, okay, there is actually something here and we should be able to revive it. The majority of folks that are doing research training still, it walks, talks, and acts like a cell side function still. So it's sort of like a high touch sales training. Desk just moved over and renamed itself. There's very few firms that can trade cross product and provide more of a, what traditionally seems a buy side function. So helping with risk and hedging and all those types of functions. So I say, you know, Ben really came up with the, the first pure play uh, two, two years ago that looks like a, a real buy side research function. What's been around before was more sell side plus. You know. Right. And so when you when you laid out this uh, this idea for it, what were the sort of key challenges before you thought, yeah, we're ready to do this? Like, how did you actually construct it? Was it was it people? Was it technology? Did you have to create new things, or was it plugging things in in a different way that already existed? A lot of us on the sell on the, that have worked on the sell side or been traders, you think that that's kind of your only skill set. Of I'm a trader. I know how to talk about equities and stocks and markets. But what what I realized was outside of that you have a you have a lot of skills and, and a lot of that a lot of people don't realize that they have. And one, it's being a salesperson. And two, dealing be, being a salesperson and pitching yourselves and speaking intelligently about a product you know well to some of the smartest people in the world. Right. So I think a lot of people sell themselves short and you know, you're constantly building things and creating things for clients. And I've kind of just took that. I've been a little bit entrepreneurial uh, in the past and pushed it over to this. So I used what I had, what I knew, you know, did my research, figured out one, you have to have a broker dealer just regardless. So that's why all outsource traders are broker dealers. Just there's various reasons, but at the heart of it, the way that you do business makes is the primary reason that you have to be a broker dealer. Now most broker now most outsource traders do sell side activities. We I always decided that we should not have any traditional sell side activities because we were then competing with the other larger investment banks who are our clients' counterparties. And then two, there's an inherent conflict of interest. No one a lot of people say there's no conflicts of interest and they're not competitors, but that's impossible. So those were like the basis of how I determined how we should set it up. And then from there you're right. We needed the best technology, but more importantly, I needed the best people. So I went out and found people that I know, I trust, and that are smarter than me and complement my shortcomings. So all of those, I think that's just for any business that that's how you should run it. Um, but that's specifically what I focused on. And there's so many tools out there that you can plug and play and mix and match to you to, to get what you need to where you think you're going to be. We, we kind of shifted from where we thought at the beginning. I thought, you know, we should be a one-stop shop. So every fund manager or portfolio manager with $50 million sitting in a room and one analyst in a Bloomberg screen, that we could run all of his other parts of his hedge fund. Yes, we probably could, but as funds get larger and our ten, t- funds tend to be larger, so our average client size is around $850 million, their needs are a little bit different because they usually have a bu- something in place or a bigger infrastructure, and a lot of those are already taking place in house for various reasons that we don't know or see that's that's more fitting for them. That and having a flexible, a flexible infrastructure is what you know. Those are the main components of of how and why we set up this business the way that we did. Take us through what those components are. So I realize that different customers might have different aspects to their own individual requirements. But what are the what are the components that you're talking about? So in, in the package, package, it's you know, okay, do you need a do you need someone to run an entire trading desk function? Like we so we setting up a little a new trading desk for you where we're going to do all the trading. All of our, all of our people will do all of your trading. What systems do you have in place? Do our do our, how do we get our systems to talk to your systems? Do you need systems? Can you leverage any of ours uh, instead of you needing to purchase new ones or upgrade? Because a lot of a lot of funds don't want to constantly be building and upgrading new systems. So what technology of ours can they leverage for our trading expertise uh, that can fit in well with their operations? And then two, 
if it's not the full trading desk and it's supplemental, so we're helping with a region like Asia, Europe during their non-time zones, or maybe it's someone in Hong Kong that wants to trade US Chinese ADRs, and then it comes down to product. We want to trade exotic FX options, or we want to trade credit and fixed income. Those are very specialized things. We can trade high yield debt. All those things are very and highly specialized. So everything we do is usually pretty bespoke, but our systems don't need to change because they can fit to any manager's needs, whether we're using some of their system and ours in a hybrid way, or they're using ours or whatever it may be. As you can, as you know, every fund is extremely different has different requirements. So that's, that's how we have to set it up. And then, but at the end of the day, there's one constant. And that constant is that every time we execute for our clients, it has to be with a counterparty that our clients have accounts at. So we are only limited by the client's selected broker list, which is typically picked by them on their basis of the value add or the services that they receive from that broker. At this, at, you know, at this point, then in aggregate across all of our clients, we execute with over 50 counterparties across the world in all asset classes. But we're not limited by those 50. If a new client comes and says, I have these 10 Norwegian brokers I want to execute with, okay, great. We can get that set up. No problem. And that includes all their prime brokers. So we have a lot of interaction with many brokers and very closely tied with their prime brokers like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, UBS, Citi, all of, all of the above. We are limited by what the client can do and can trade and is set up to do. But sky's the limit for what after that. If they want something to be set up, then we can do it for them. So have you ever... Off the back of that, have you ever had a customer come to you and say, look, we'd really, we want to trade this product or be in this location. Uh, and you look at it and you go, look, I don't have, I don't have the right people yet. Give me a month to find. So like, do, do you, do you sort of recruit and acquire skills or technology or people off the back of that? Yes. So recent example being, um, you know, so one, we try to always have a good mix of traders, mostly multi-asset because at least from there they can trade a lot of products so that saves us we don't staff extra traders mm. right because it's just staffing people to sit here it's not it's not very appropriate we also keep a, th- a you know a max three clients to one trader so one trader covering three 500 plus million dollar hedge funds is about as most as, as much as they could handle capacity wise before dropping the ball and not providing a premium service so we cap it at that I don't know what some of our competitors are, but I would like to say it's easily probably more like 10, 20, 30 uh, clients to a trader. We're more ingrained in their process. So yes, we will have to go out and find specialists in certain areas. So we've gotten a lot more inquiries about fixed income and credit markets. So we recently hired a head of fixed income and credit to join our team. And she came from a large asset manager uh, and previously worked on the sell side because we, we noticed that more and more equity, pure equity managers actually want to trade across the uh, across the capital structure, but just didn't have the necessary tools to do so. Um, so we've seen a lot more inquiries in that space, and I, you know, felt we felt the need that we needed a highly specialized person to run that process. So, Michael, I, I'm kind of curious. It, it must be a challenge talking to customers here because because if you're talking to someone that's already in the business. Presumably, the the people you're talking to are the ones that made the decisions and kind of the infrastructure they have now, or the things they put in place. So, so do you ever see any kind of uh, uh, people saying no? But I really feel comfortable the way I'm doing it here, and and I get it, but I, I don't really want to make the change, and and they're a little bit nervous on that. Um, so I guess there's um, three different conversations. So one would be a new hedge fund launch or uh, an asset manager launch, and there <clears throat> the trend um, has been to outsource. Um, so it's more of a what's your model versus the others, um, and whether it be a tier two prime broker that's you know, adding it in. And then it's just getting them comfortable with how our model works. And you know, we help uh, hedge funds launch their business through advisory, and um, it'll basically be a uh, a guide for them, and they really enjoy us being there with their experience and being to the table. The next conversation is more of a CIO saying, look, I, I'm i growing in AUM. I have one trader, I have an analyst trading, but you know the AUM is, is increasing, we're doing well, I now need to institutionalize a desk. So is this an option? 
And we've actually had a lot of success in that um, sweet spot, if you will, whereby we're able to communicate, you know, rather than spending six months buying all the software and uh, finding talent, um, we can come in and very quickly get up to speed. And the last one, um, where we've also actually found success is where our clients um, have been with other search training firms and again have um, grown at AUM and want more of a premium service. And then they come to this sort of fork in the road where is there another search training option where I don't have to deal with the HR, you know, deal with the bonus of the internal trader, all that kind of stuff, or do I have to do that? And, and we can fit in nicely as sort of a um, next step from, a, I guess, a more traditional plug and play system. Quick comment to that because it's it's very it's very familiar what you're saying is well I created it this way so why would I ever change it but it's like is it really that unfathomable that the way that you've done something could not be the most optimal optimal way of doing it and you have no way of knowing that unless you've seen every way of doing it and that is your expertise and most people that set up these set up trading desks are COOs, CFOs on the business side. For most COOs I've ever met have never traded before. So it's very difficult, in my opinion, for them. You know, I think a lot of them set them up very well, right? But why not get the extra, at least, inquiry about it to see? And, I, you know, and that's something that we've modeled ourselves after. So one, our COO um, is an ex-trader. Uh, he was a partner at Paulson and co and a trader there. So he's seen a hedge fund grow from very small to massive, even as on the trading side. So, um, he understands that Michael has been an operating partner at a hedge fund. So seen that as well. And I think seeing these builds and knowing, and I've worked at a lot of different places, yeah. use a lot of systems. And every time I knew is like, I never want to be handcuffed by whatever I have done. We've changed systems three times, but it hasn't been that difficult because we made sure that it's flexible because there's always new things and there's always something to learn and improve upon. And you find that the really great, yeah. great COOs will have that open mindset where they're, you know, continual growth and um, best practice. The clients that don't work with us are the ones that are closed minded, um, but there's enough open minded people that we were, we were, uh, we're happy to meet them. You know, I can see certainly for new startups because a, a new startup, they already have enough things on their plate. What they really want to do is focus on whatever their USP is in launching, right? And they want to get to that. And so you want to say, well, what do I have to do and what do I want to do and where do I add extra value and how do I lay off the other stuff? I think that to me is is you know, not a no-brainer, but but I can see people saying, yeah, absolutely, let, let's figure out the best way to do things. So So I get that. Going into a new asset class or a new market, Again, the challenge for a lot of these guys, if they're in a different time zone or a product that they that they have an, a, a thesis on in terms of managing but not trading, again, I, I see that as being you know, pretty straightforward. That's you know, it, it sounds like a lot of brain damage to do anything except outsource it <laughs> or at least investigate it, and and it's really that. It's really the the guys who've been functioning a while. We've been doing okay. We're growing, so that proves that we're doing okay. And to me, that sounds like it's a little bit more of a little bit more it's of a. It's funny lift. you say that because I was just kind of doing the numbers in my head. I would say <clears throat> less than twenty percent of the funds that we that we trade for um, are new launches or specific new product add to a strategy or region. The majority of the clients that we do trade for, we actually do all of the trading. So, um, and they have switched for whatever reason, kind of like Michael said, maybe they had a stop gap of an analyst because of a cost or, or whatever it may be, or maybe they're just not monitoring the trading. They just send out the orders, leave them with brokers and that's it. So I think over time, and there's a lot more due diligence going on, right? There's a lot, it's a lot harder to raise capital. So if you're trying to raise, if you're trying to raise assets, I think investors now have a lot more say and are a lot more honed in on what your infrastructure looks like and your business infrastructure and how is your business run, which is where most funds kind of put their trading. It's kind of like a hybrid between business and investment team. Most funds do consider it kind of a business cost though. So that that's pretty interesting. So do you think that's driven by competitive pressure, whether you're, you're talking about capital raising or, or performance? Any, any, any views on that? Well, if you're not performing um, well, it's going to be uh, 
challenging either way. I think so. I think not performing well creates every challenge. If you if you perform well, you have less issues to worry about from outside looking in, inside out, etc. But I think Michael can probably speak a bit more specifically. Yeah. Yeah, no, look, I think there's a sort of feeling that if you're running a decent sized fund, having one person be your execution arm is a little madness, especially with COVID. You need to have backup. And having the CFO who doesn't know trading as just keeps no backup is not ideal. Um, so having a deep bench um, like, like we do at Marikai, where you know there's always holding cover, and that holding cover understands account and there's not like a, a drop in service, which you traditionally would find at a, a one person trading desk or fund. And I think that, you know, the idea of having a checks and balances is also becoming important. Having somebody that comes in that understands trading and is able to, to deal with it. Where I think there is a, a risk is that um, if you do have a lot of volatility in the market and everybody's using, you know, so there's trading firm, um, you know, Ben mentioned this earlier, where Potentially, they have 30 clients per trader. Everybody's going to trade at the same time. And then it actually you know, adds more risk. And so that's why we've been very careful at America to keep it at one to three so that even if all three need it, it's fine. We can handle it. We can deal with it. And you know, we had a recent example where one client needed help and needed us to step in within 24 hours' notice, and we were able to do it and, and, um, and help them out. And so internally, we always keep a little bit of spare capacity, but our traders have the ability to, to really act as though they were an internal trader, um, but on sort of a variable model. Yeah, you raise a good point. I, I can't remember a podcast that I've done that I haven't talked about COVID, <laughs> so I suppose we have to do it here. Do, have attitudes changed in your conversations beforehand and afterwards for exactly the point that you raised there, where they're going, geez, we realize just one person, what if they end up getting sick? Right, you know, or or being off is that have people's thoughts changed, or were they thinking that beforehand anyway? Not sure if they thought it beforehand. Maybe it opened their eyes more this time, and they weren't really willing, probably, to hire another person. So then it came, what do we do? I think a lot of our competitors got a lot of new business as pure backup scenario disaster recoveries. And that's just something like Michael said that we're not, we don't really do. And it's on purpose because if you need a backup, it's likely 10 other people need the backup at the exact same time. And how do you staff something like that? So, and then also what we do is we're so ingrained in the funds and maybe we're logging into their systems or we see their portfolios. And it's, it's very hard for you to just on switch up a dime for a trader to integrate themselves, <laughs> have that dialogue with the portfolio manager and be able to do a really good job for them. That's If you're just a pure backup, that's not that difficult if you're receiving orders and shares over a fixed connection every day. I mean, why not just send it to your broker directly? I don't, I don't really see the, the, the benefit or the value add in that. But yeah, attitudes changed a little bit more, I think, on, you know, I've always, I've, we've always been cloud-based. I've always had to work and be available 24 hours a day, trading night, trading the day, whatever it may be. So I've always been able to work remotely from home um, when I'm out of the office. Most, a lot of funds were not set up to that. And that was a little bit shock, eye-popping for me is the amount of people I've heard, you know, we heard about and needed new technology to make remote work possible. For us, it was just, it's just every day, like no problem. <clears throat> but then they became a lot more comfortable and like, oh, my trader doesn't actually need to be sitting right next to me for me to have a really good trading experience with my trading desk. And I think that mindset changed. I think the mindset was always probably there that they needed a backup scenario, but that just really pushed on the point of how much you really needed a backup scenario because people were out for two weeks at a time, just getting sick. I want to go into the actual process. Let's say, let's say I, I want to do, what do I actually have to do to get ready? But I do, one of the things I always wonder about when I hear about these outsourced trading operations, what's, what about the communication and the flow of information between the trader and the PMs? Uh, you know, do they, do they lose anything by not having it sort of in the same room or a few desks away? I mean, how, how does, how does that interplay work? Most of them are not in the same room uh, in general. <clears throat> Most CIOs, 
that run funds, most don't speak to their trading desk that much. If they're a trader at heart in nature, maybe they come over and talk to the desk more so than others. And in that case, they probably would have, you know, their traders, if that's a very important aspect for them to have their traders in house. But, you know, we can have webcams with people, we can talk on Slack, we can talk on Bloomberg, we can talk on Teams, you know, we do email, we do phone calls. It's as much as they want to speak with, and you'd probably find that more and more CIOs and portfolio managers don't want to speak as much as one would have thought uh, to their trading desk. Because you know, it's not the constant back and forth dialogue. It's specific times about specific things. And I think we're seeing that more and more across just workflows in general that you need to be sitting doing your deep work at certain times and then have scheduled other times where you want to talk about things and you know not with trading a bit a bit less because something new always comes up but in this day unfortunately i mean not fortunately and unfortunately more people are not as oral of communication is not as prevalent anymore it's you know a lot more typing and and whatnot but the phone works just as just as well See, I took my handwriting was so bad when I was a young child that when I was seven years old, my teacher <laughs> gave up on me and she said, Roy, you're never actually going to be able to develop your handwriting. Here's a typewriter. So literally in 1968, I had a typewriter in front of me and I was typing for a while. She was trying to make a point to me, which she did, but I ended up getting a typewriter for, for Christmas. And I took, I was literally the only, I think I was the only guy in my uh, typing class in high school. And, uh, and look, it worked out. It worked out. So I've always been able to type with two hands, even at my advanced age. Um, but yeah, so, so you're right. I mean, I, I think that kind of written communication is is much more commonplace than than and more before. funds are more compliant so it's it's got a it's much it's a much more it's a better audit record and transcript of yeah. what someone actually said they maybe wanted to do versus what is in proof yeah and hopefully people are more careful with how they write things than you often hear telephone you know, I have never seen a transcript in court from traders that actually <laughs> looks good because you never get the context, right? Uh, so, so let's say I'm I'm a, a COO and I said, yeah, uh, I I, I want to do that. Yeah, tell tell me what's the process of making this change because it sounds like you know trading is is so ingrained in what we do. What does it mean to actually outsource it practically? Not a whole lot, to be honest. Um, we we are. Um able to integrate into a fund's um, infrastructure ecosystem very, very um, simply. Where it takes more work is to actually understand what their best X policy is, how to communicate with the CIO, and ensure that he feels supported. And our goal is to make sure that he feels complete comfort and safety so that he can focus on generating alpha. And so what we will do is we'll set up fixed lines with with their systems and or we can be in their systems and really spend a lot of time figuring out what they need in order to, to um, fill their processes and then also what their uh, their goals are. Um, our team gets up to speed and then it's it's very, very similar to having an in-house trader. And so we're either an extension of their existing trading team or we'll be, the, we'll be their trading team as, as Ben described. It's probably less complex to fit into someone else's process because we, you know, we've seen enough instances of how we do that, and and we streamline that, and more complex around creating a whole desk for someone, and then you know, because then you're at also with them about implementing various things and deciding, you know, what systems and what works best for you and what ties in, um, and that just takes a little longer. And one of the things that you touched on, I think, earlier, Ben, and and this, you know. Michael, I'm sure this comes up in all your conversations because the, the reality is that your clients will all have you know, wallet commitments at, uh, at various agencies. So what, how does that work? Yeah, so I guess um, for, for our purposes, we're completely agnostic. The, the client uh, determines where their, wallet, their commission wallet gets spent. Um, we can help them manage that wallet um, based on what parameters they provide. And you know, we're, we're paid separately. Um, it's one of the reasons why this model is, is very um, 
I guess, well liked by the cell side in that you know, we're not eating their lunch per se. We're not set in the middle of this completely transparent. Um, and the cell side knows that we only get paid by our clients for such trading. There's no additional revenue streams to us. And so it's, it's very, uh, very clean. But <clears throat> let's uh, say as an example, client has three brokers and they want to pay each one equally. Um, we will ensure that happens. And so that all the brokers are made happy in clients. Uh, Clients could, the only time that we'll get involved in, in broker conversations is if the client says, okay, I want to enter into trading in, in Denmark or Bangladesh or, or a new market, can you suggest a couple of brokers that you think might work? And then we'll go out and try to find them a couple of options and then let them do the diligence. But that's the extent of our sort of involvement in the actual broker deal. Yeah, so I'm curious, how do the receiving brokers um, take it? Like, so because you're being hired for your expertise. Doesn't that make their their spreads thinner? So aren't they aren't they a little bit concerned when well, you show up? It, in the traditional outsource models, it does make their spreads thinner, and and but in ours, it absolutely does not. So what happens is, client has a list of ten counterparties they want to trade with, and let's just say for argument's sake, <laughs> across the board, they pay them all um, five basis points in Asia or three cents in the U.S. When we get involved now, we tell execution broker, and it's transparent to them and transparent with the client, here is a new fee that you're going to add on top for our trading. It is So if you were charging five and now you're charging, you're going to charge a client 10, the client knows five is for the broker, five is for us. We're not saying, okay, now it's going to be five total and broker, you're two and we're three. Well, our service is different, and and we're very, you know, firm on that. That we don't want to be seen as it because that, you know, the brokers are providing completely separate service to what you, an in-house trader yeah. provides, and that's how we want to be viewed. Sometimes they, I think, if they're not used to our way of doing business, at first, you're right. That's probably what they think, and then they're like, oh, I don't, you know, I'm not going to have as close of a contact with the client. But soon they figure out that it's the exact same thing. We are basically the exact same thing as a client. If you ask them something about trading, they'll deflect it to us to, to ask us. And we'll behave ourselves in a manner and speak and represent our clients just as if we are a part of their team. Then they have a few less touch points. Professional traders that is easier for a sell-side trader to deal with than maybe a not-so-professional buy-side trader. Yes, very very delicately put. So look, this sounds fantastic. Surely there's got to be some kind of hurdle or challenge or why doesn't everyone do it? Yeah, look, I think people, until they understand it, maybe they don't want to look at it. They think there may be conflicts of interest or, you know, all the same things you said, like, well, you're taking a spread. So maybe, the, you know, you're, you're hurting the sell side. So instantly, maybe that's why. And, you know, I think in our model in particular, after we explain it, it's a lot clearer and a lot cleaner, but I think they need to do their due diligence on it. And maybe they have a great internal trader, internal buy side trader that can't be replaced. And that definitely is the case. You know, we have a, all, everyone here has been a buy side trader and they're all great traders. Um, you know, so, you know, maybe the fund needs that main trader and they're okay having him train a junior trader to get them up to speed because that makes the most sense for, for them. One of our hurdles, I guess we could say, is <clears throat> as opposed to some of our competitors that are offering outsource trading under a, under their PB service, they can't just come to us and not have to set up any other brokers or do anything. They just have one document with or multiple documents with one you know counterparty, and they'll take care of everything for them: trading, PB service, execution, etc. So sometimes. I guess newer managers may not see us as able to be a one-stop shop, but that is true. We don't offer you know prime brokerage services. No, I was going to say, um, just on that note, and um, you've actually created a lot of soft partners with um, or partnerships, excuse me, with uh, other fintechs. So um, Kayenta, who I think you guys have had on the show, um, uh, is a great treasury um, software system. We've got a similar thing with. Um, NeoVest, which is actually a management system, um, this system called Northstar. We've gone down and tried to find system providers that are very, very, very good at what they do and only focus on one thing so that we can 
very easily um, help our clients get up to speed and and bring best of best of breed systems. And, but you know, for smaller clients that are happy to go to an all-in-one shop, it works. <clears throat> As they grow, that model tends to break down because those all-in-one shops are quasi-competitors to other brokers. And if those funds want to source liquidity and they do it through a broker, you know, broker-broker liquidity is different than fund-to-broker liquidity. And so then you get treated like a broker, not as a fund. And that's where, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that's a fork in the road where the clients are like, well, I'm big enough now that I need to have <clears throat> the cavitas of my fund name and my wallet so I can access this uh, unique pools of liquidity. And that's where we can step in and help them. Um, are, th- are there other models or, yeah, or they is that have a, a hybrid? A hybrid, maybe a main trader who does their primary U.S. markets and then outsource it to us to do Asia and Europe because obviously it's very difficult, one, to trade 24 hours, and two, if you aren't local or traded local or been in those markets, especially in Asia, there's so many nuances and so many pitfalls that it's very dangerous to not have a very seasoned person understanding those markets. So sometimes that's a, you know, I call it kind of like a hybrid, like a hybrid version. You can trade, you can trade late into the night. You can trade, you can, you can have traders in any location trading, but it is about the experience level in, in those markets. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, that, I, I think, think you know, you can, you know, they say like before we had a Hong Kong office opening, they said some, you know, I've been asked before, but you don't have presence in Hong Kong. And I said, well, look, maybe I don't right now capable of trading it from here. But I've spent the majority of my career in Asia. So compared to someone who hasn't, you know, I, I would I would argue that we still have that expertise down from actually living and breathing it there versus maybe not sitting there at this point. Um, and then that may come down to like products. So we're you know, we're now in we're now having a lot of conversations and and partnered, you know, partnered with um, you know, Cross Tower is, you know, a strategic partner with Cross Tower, who's a multi-asset institutional trading platform and and capital markets desk for digital assets. So we're starting with crypto, so cryptocurrency. So it's hard to be an expert at everything. So yeah, so maybe it's, hey, can you help us with fixed income trading? Because our current trader is great at equities, but we really want someone with some relationships in the fixed income in the fixed income world. Wait, do you see this trend? sort of carrying on um do you think this will become really a core of of what everyone does or what what are your thoughts on on outsourcing in in general i think it's um akin to sort of back in the day where all funds had servers and you know the idea of moving to the cloud was like no 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 our data internally and now you know doing that is nuts right because it's you know we need the cloud to protect you um I think it's similar where you know folks will have a hybrid model. You'll have a senior head of trading who will either be a head of risk or a head of relationship management and will will be um, a business manager and a risk manager, as well as sort of infrastructure and systems, but then he'll have the ability to do it. I also see OSIRS trading moving into different uh, verticals within uh, the financial ecosystem. So it's a wealth management, RA, we see that in insurance companies, there's a lot of um, folks that are doing things and doing it suboptimally because they don't think there's another option. And so you could have a, a large institution that wants a pension that wants to trade a lot of bonds and they just don't know how. And so I think as this model develops and more and more people enter the space, um, it's not a crowded space because there's so much room <laughs> to grow. Um, it's actually, I think it's a positive that we're getting more entrants and then it'll just sort of blossom. It, the, the alternative funds are the, the ones most likely to be able to adapt it because they kind of run their own show and make their own decisions. So it's it's easier for them to do that and maybe they appreciate the value of trading and, and upping the game on trading. But you're saying that it's more likely or, or you expect it will kind of uh, migrate to more traditional uh, managers? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, the funds have been able to be more nimble because they're smaller and they're, there's less bureaucracy. But I also think the OSIRS trading needed time to develop and to also institutionalize itself. And I think we're seeing, you know, that we've seen, you know, folks migrating to this, this um, area, which traditionally weren't here, that were either very senior people in the south or the buy side. And so it's, it's a very different OSIRS trading I guess, staff and model than it was four years ago. I think it just continues to develop. And 
in America has been mentioned, we hired uh, Megan to run our fixed income and, and um, credit trading. And you just look at the growth that we're going to see and some of our peers are looking looking for. Um, it was really exciting. So, Yes, and, uh, and digital assets, I'm looking forward to uh, catching up with you guys in a year and two years uh, from now and seeing how, how that's going. Because that, I, I think that will be interesting because it uh, who knows where that will go. Yeah. Is this what you, where you expected to be a couple of years down the road? Oh, great. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I think it's continuing to grow. Um, I think it's good that there's competition. It's also good that we do things differently. You know, we're not, we're not for everyone to be fair. We may have, someone may call us and wants to do outsource trading and we take a look at it and say, look, you're probably not the right fit for us and we're probably not the right fit for you at this time but there are other options and we can say here you know here's some of the names that you maybe you should should chat with um i think that's 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 good for you know business it it makes the outsource trading brand outsource trading name more well known um and it also keeps everybody in check you know of figuring out best practices and and shedding light on different things that should be more transparent i did not expect in the last two years for the outsource trading. And I think a lot of it was because of COVID to really get on the map as much. You know, if you had asked me, do you think UBS will start an outsource trading desk? I would have said, absolutely not. And there's many reasons why most of them will, never will. None of the PBs ever will. So that one was surprising. Um, but I think that, you know, like Michael had hinted at, there is a group of people and a lot of corporates and their corporate clients and, you know, very, wealthy family offices in Europe, et cetera, that, that only do stuff at UBS. And that makes a lot of sense. I totally understand why they would introduce this concept. Um, but I did not expect it to go that way, you know, call it two years ago. You know, I think I've always been comfortable with the, and proved the concept of the type of clients I thought that we were going to see come to our model. And we've been, we've been lucky and we're grateful uh, that we have great partners and great clients um, that we love to work with every day. They're nice people at the end of the day. So you know, life is way too short to not have that. So we are extremely lucky. And and I have a great team. And you know we've grown from two of us and one client to 10 of us and 10, over 10 clients in two years. So you know, we're, you know, we're, I think that's pretty good growth. And it's also, we're not trying to be the biggest. We just want to be the best. And you know, we're not, we don't look at as many clients as possible. We want to offer the best service to our clients and be extremely meaningful to them. And I think, you know, I think outsource trading is going to grow and it's going to grow in different ways and different facets. Um, and like we said, everyone has a different need all the time. Fund structures will change, more managed accounts, more complexities, more regulatory. All of these things breed good competition and create spaces for niche type uh competitors and players like ourselves to fit in for what is an you know a very large pool of of um asset managers in this world All right well listen uh guys thank you so much i i learned a lot I, you know i love talking to you guys uh you know we've done a couple of things together now i always come away with a, a little bit more information so uh appreciate that Thanks for that. And to uh, listeners and viewers, I'll be back in a couple of minutes uh, with uh, my sort of closing thoughts on today's episode. So thanks, everyone, and uh, see you guys soon. Thanks for having us. All right. All right. Okay, so that was another interesting chat for me, and I hope for you as well. And it's always useful, I think, to learn about new things and have my preconceived notions challenged. For me, there's four takeaways from this episode. Uh, number one, everyone faces the pressure of doing more with less without sacrificing quality. And that includes asset managers. So how does an asset manager trade new products or new regions uh, or deal with business expansion while still delivering the quality that fueled their growth in the first place? Number two, uh, in addition to something new or different, I think a lot of firms have really been surprised by how badly uh, they were affected by COVID in their daily uh, activity, and frankly, how thin that delivery can be. So 
if if you have a vulnerability, your question needs to be then, is that vulnerability something that is a competitive advantage for us? And so I will beef it up to make certain it's not a vulnerability or um, be willing to accept it because I don't have any more resources to pump into that. So, so you need to say, is it important or is it just something that we have to do as part of our business function? And so it might make more sense to outsource it to get, um, uh, I guess, better depth and breadth of delivery. Uh, number three, getting back to this point on disruption. There's a lot of disruptors out there. And the challenge is, how do you do that without threatening those that are already in the continuum and maybe even providing the service? And the Marikai solution seems to me to take kind of a different approach in the sense that the one that's really being disrupted or changed actually is the client and how they're how they're doing their daily activity and rather that than the counterparties so there's no reason for any sort of pushback for uh, counterparties that's just the way it is they deal with an outsourced service provider uh, and the client who is the one that has to change the way they do it what they're getting in exchange is maybe a better, my more diverse, uh, deeper, whatever uh, improvement to its capabilities. So this disruption without disrupting the ecosystem seems to me to be a likely uh, recipe for success. Finally, I talked at the beginning about uh, a challenge or an invitation. Um, I think there's scope where this model might apply to securities finance. And we've been working on this for not quite a year. Uh, probably about 11 months now. And I'd love to share my thoughts and ideas with you. So uh, please feel free to get in contact with me if you think it's an interesting idea uh, via LinkedIn or as always my email, Roy at peerpoint.info. So that's my summary for this episode. Uh, as always, we encourage you to share topics and guests and ideas that you want us to uh, bring to you. Uh, drop me a line at the email that I talked about or in the show notes below. Um, or uh, if you're uh, watching this on on the video cast because we now do a video cast version of all these podcasts you can leave uh, suggestions in the comments below and we of course uh, always respond uh, there'll be links for ben and michael in the show notes um, and finally the free securities finance content which i mentioned earlier and keep talking about is available at our website uh, we're active on linkedin and facebook uh, so hopefully we'll see you there. And that's it for me. I'm Roy Zimmer Hansel. This has been Pierpoint Perspectives, the art of securities finance. And I look forward to catching you next time.